Hello everyone and happy new year. Today we are publishing the ASWA guideline in the third trimester of cystic ultrasound. Um, ASWA have um, guideline on the first trimester ultrasound and the second trimester ultrasound, but we did not really have a dedicated um, guideline on the third trimester of cystic ultrasound. And in fact, most organizations don't have a dedicated one on the third trimester ultrasounds. Um, and I would just like to take the opportunity to thank all the co-authors uh, for, for their contribution um, to this uh, document. What I'm gonna do in this um, really short video is just to focus on maybe one section of the guideline and share with you the recommendations. But first of all, I'd like you to really move away from the concept that the third trimester ultrasound is just a gross scan and move to the concept of a checklist. And this is a checklist that we included in the, this guideline from viability to looking at the placenta location, the fetal presentation, the biometry, looking at assessment of the fluid volume, the dopplers when indicated, and looking at the fetal anatomy. And this is would be the a number of the views that you might need to obtain on the third trimester ultrasound scan, but that obviously depends on the indication and what you find and the and the risk factors. So if a woman had a previous cesarean section and have a placenta previa, you might obviously look at uh, the uh, features of the uh, placenta accretum. So I'm going to just share with you the section on the abnormalities of the amniotic fluid uh, volume and how we diagnose polyhydramnias or oligohydramnias. And of course, we have the amniotic fluid index or the deepest vertical pocket and the commonly sort of used interchangeably. But if you look at evidence, you find that for the low volume, so for example, for oligohydramnias, the positive predictive value is actually higher for the using the deepest vertical pocket than amniotic fluid index suggests that GBS vertical pocket is better to diagnose oligohydramnias, while actually for the high volume, you find the amniotic fluid index had a higher positive predictive value than the GBS vertical pocket. So the DVP is superior for identification of the oligohydramnias, while the AFI is superior for identification of the polyhydramnias. So how you diagnose polyhydramnias? The AFI 25 centimeter or more, or DVP 8 centimeter or more, but as I showed you, the AFI seems to perform better. And the, of course, you assess the level of severity of the polyhydramnias, depending on the, there is a mild, moderate, and severe, as you can see here with the uh, various cutoffs. And why is it important? Because in fact, the likelihood of finding an underlying condition actually correlate with the severity. So if in moderate or severe polyhydramnias, you can identify 90%. Um, of uh, um, sort of anomaly or maternal placenta cause, while in mild polyhydramnias only 17%. Of course, the number of causes of polyhydramnias, about 20 25% because of maternal diabetes, more than half is idiopathic, but uh, that's a diagnosed by exclusion. So you need to look for fetal abnormalities, and the third trimester will be more, mostly gastrointestinal obstruction that would be associated with polyhydramnias, but also could be cardiac uh, or uh, CNS lesions. But look at the placenta, because you could have placental tumor like coiangioma, fetal infections, um, the condition that can cause anemia or hyperdynamic circulation, and of course, chromosomal or genetic abnormalities. Polyhydramnias is not a benign. Uh, finding on the scan. It is associated with adverse outcomes. And you see here the auto ratios, so the risk of intratrine demise, 7.6, about eight times higher. Neonatal deaths, 8.7. And you know, it twice the risk of inadmission to the neonatal unit. Macrosomia, about three times higher. So the infection is twice as high. And therefore, if you find polyhydramnus, what you need to, to do is to assess the detailed ultrasound scan, looking for abnormalities, fetus, placenta, testing the mother for diabetes, looking for signs, anemia, so MCA, pixel velocity, uh, looking obviously the risk of anabloidy or infection, um, and as I mentioned, idiopathic polyhydramnus is a diagnosis of exclusion. We would perform a new drainage only if the woman is uh, symptomatic, and of course, the counseling about the perinatal complication, which I shared with you. An important question, can polyhydramnias resolve? And the answer is yes, in about 30 to 40% of the cases, particularly if it was an early diagnosis and if it was low AFI, so mild polyhydramnias. And if it does resolve, there's no increase in the risk of adverse outcomes. What about oligohydramnias? We agreed, GBS vertical pocket is better, two centimeters is a cutoff. And in fact, this RCT would um, show you, sort of demonstrate that. So this RCT, so singleton pregnancies at ultrasound, a term, and either using the AFI 
or using the DBS vertica pocket. And if you use the AFI, you diagnose more oligodramnius, 10% compared to 2%. You diagnose you more induction of labor for oligodramnius, more abnormal CTG, but there's no really benefit. There's no risk. There's no significant difference in any admission or other perinatal uh, uh, outcomes. So you more interventions without improving perinatal outcomes. Similar to uh, the uh, polyhydramnias, there are causes of the oligohydramnias, including abnormalities, particularly urinary abnormalities, like bilateral neogenesis or um, urinary obstructive uropathy, but also small babies due to placenta insufficiency or fetal infection like CMV and avoid geogenetic abnormalities. The commonest cause of oligohydramnias in the third trimester is rupture of membranes, but also think about other things. So take history, for example, for drugs, and uh, again, there will be a proportion which are idiopathic. Oligodramnus, again, is associated with uh, uh, adverse uh, outcomes. So the risk of meconium aspiration is auto ratio is about three times higher. So the in section of fetal distress twice as high in a transmission, twice as high. Um, and therefore, a common practice is to induce labor at 37 to 38 weeks in cases of idiopathic or oligohydramnias, but there is a variation in the guideline. So really the recommendation was that DVP is preferred or over AFI for diagnosing isolated oligohydramnias because associated with fewer induction of labor while having similar prenatal outcomes. And the detection of polyhydramnias, you should really need to target the investigation for underlying cause because idiopathic polyhydramnias is a diagnosis of exclusion. I'm going to stop here. Um, thank you for your attention. I really hope that you um, find the article useful uh, for your um, practice and you enjoy reading the guideline. Thank you very much for your attention.